concept two, we are going to be talking about protein synthesis. So how our cells make proteins. Because remember, proteins are one of those four macromolecules that you cannot live without and they run your cells. So this is the process of reading those instructions that we said are stored in your DNA. And then from those instructions, we're going to make a polypeptide. Now, remember from unit one, concept three macromolecules, the polymer of proteins is a polypeptide. And a polypeptide is a chain of amino acids. Amino acids are the monomer. And then those combine to other polypeptides and fold into a protein. So if you remember, proteins have four levels to their structure. First is that sequence of amino acids, what order those amino acids will be linked together in a bipeptide bonds to form a polypeptide chain. That's level one. So this is what we're doing today. We're going to talk about how we read the instructions on DNA to know how to make this. But then remember there are other levels. Then we have the secondary structure, which is either it folds into a beta sheet or twists into an alpha helix. We have the tertiary structure where it gets bent and folded into a more three-dimensional shape. And then we have the quaternary structure where two or more of those polypeptide chains get bound together to form the end result of the protein. Remember, proteins are our most diverse macromolecule and shape dictates function or form dictates, dictates function. So this is really important that they have, they have such a complex structure because that allows them to have such a variety of uses for the cell. So we're talking here just about this polypeptide, this amino acid sequence. That's what we're going to make today. But I may often re just refer to protein because eventually this will fold and go through all these other levels of structure to make a protein. So we're talking about how a protein gets made, but we're really only going to zoom in on this first part. So the central dogma of genetics would kind of be, if I had to summarize genetics into one sentence or one overarching thought, this is what it would be. So here's the background for it. First, remember your DNA equals the instructions for making you who you are and, and the instructions for making proteins. And your DNA is in the nucleus of your cells and it can't leave it. It's a really large bulky molecule. It can't leave the nucleus. Here's a cell, here's your nucleus. But remember, Proteins are made in ribosomes, and ribosomes are on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and they're also floating in the cytoplasm. So we have an issue because the instruction manual is here, but the proteins are made here. It'd be like if you are making a pie at your granny's house, but you left the recipe at your house that you live in. Okay, so we have an issue here. So this is why protein synthesis, it's going to take two large steps to do it. First is transcription. To transcribe means to make a copy. When you um, need a copy of your grades, you go to your counselor at school and you ask for a transcript. You ask for a copy of all your grades. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy the DNA. We're going to transcribe it into RNA. Look at this. RNA remembers a single strand. It's a much smaller molecule than DNA. That RNA is small enough to leave the nucleus and go to the ribosome, and then we're going to translate it. We're going to translate the nucleic acid language into the protein language, and that's how we're going to know how to make the polypeptide that it'll eventually fold and become a protein. Okay, so it's a two-step process. This down here is our central dogma, DNA to RNA to protein. That is the process we're going to be going through, and it's two overarching um, sub-processes, if you will, and we'll go through each of these today. Now, before we do that, I do need to mention there are lots of types of RNA, but three really key ones we're going to need to know. The first is messenger RNA. It's often referred to as mRNA, and that is specifically a little m with a big RNA. Now, this is what you're thinking of when you think of what we talked about in concept one and what you're picturing in concept one. It's just that single strand of nucleotides, and it's just a copy of the instructions from DNA. And then it's going to carry that message of the instructions to the ribosomes that are in the cytoplasm. So this is our messenger. It's going to make a copy of the instructions and carry it to the ribosome. Now, tRNA stands for transfer RNA. On one end, it has something called an anticodon, which we'll get to. But on the other end, this is an amino acid. 
So based on what the instructions say, it's going to bring the materials to build the polypeptide chain. It's going to transfer them to the ribosome. So it's binding and carrying these amino acids to the ribosome to assemble the polypeptide that will make up the protein. And then last is our RNA, which is ribosomal RNA. And this is, um, along with proteins, it makes up the structure of the ribosome. Um, so that's important. And this is made by the nucleolus. You may remember that from unit two cells when we learn about organelles. Um, oh, the rRNA also helps to catalyze the formation of the peptide bonds between the amino acids. But that's just another little fun fact. Okay, first we are going to talk through transcription. So remember, transcribe, transcript. We're making a copy. We're going from DNA to RNA. And more specifically, we're going from DNA to mRNA, that messenger RNA. So again, the overarching purpose is to carry the code or carry the instructions out of the nucleus because your DNA cannot leave the nucleus. So we need to get those instructions out. So where does this happen? It happens in the nucleus because that's where your DNA is. It starts with DNA and we're going to end the process with mRNA. So what happens? First, we unzip the gene that needs to be copied. Now, this is important. This is different from DNA replication, where DNA replication, we're going to copy the entire strand of DNA. Here, we're only going to unzip the portion that we need. Remember, your DNA is bunched up into chromosomes, and sections of chromosomes are genes that code for proteins. And so there could be a thousand genes on one chromosome. So we're just going to unzip the gene that we need to copy. So it's very efficient. Then we're going to use complementary base pairing rules to match the RNA nucleotides with the exposed DNA nucleotides. Now, remember, RNA does not have thymine. It only has uracil. So look down here. Remember, the, this purple right here is my DNA that's being unzipped. The red is showing the RNA that's being made. So the G on the DNA corresponds with the C on the RNA. And A corresponds with U. Because again, RNA won't have T's. G goes with C. Now the T on the DNA still goes with A. T will still pair with A. So you'll see how the A's go with U's and the C's go with G's there. Once the gene has been copied, the mRNA will be released. And then the DNA zips back up and the mRNA can leave the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm to the ribosome where it will be translated. So again, DNA is being copied into a complementary strand of mRNA. So your DNA is getting unzipped, and then we're going to make a copy of it with the mRNA, and then your DNA zips back up and your mRNA is released to leave the nucleus. Now, transcription is a little bit more complicated, and there are some words that I want to make sure you understand before we move forward. You may have heard of genetic code. When we talk about the genetic code, we're talking about the code of instructions for how to make proteins. And it looks like, let me see if I can skip ahead, it looks like this. Okay, now this looks tricky to read, but essentially we read your RNA in threes, in triplets or codons. And this code shows the first codon, the second codon is the second ring, and then the third codon, or the third nucleotide in the codon, excuse me, is the third ring. So let's say the code said A, A, A. You start in the center, A, and move outward. A, and then there's the other A. So A, A, A is the code for lysine, the amino acid lysine. We have all the amino acids listed here on the outside of the genetic code. Okay, so we're going to use this. It's like a puzzle almost. You're going to be like decoding things. We're going to use this genetic code. Remember, this is called translation. We're translating from nucleic acid language to amino acid language that will make the protein. Okay, so we're going to use that genetic code. That's what we're talking about here. A codon, like I just mentioned, is a set of three nucleotides on the mRNA. So think about the nucleotides like letters and codons are words. So we're going to read them in three-letter words or three-letter increments. On the tRNA, we have an anticodon. It is the complement to the nucleotides on the mRNA. So it, let's say, look at this codon, it's UCA. The complement to that, based on complementary base pairing rules, is AGU. 
Okay, and so we do that so that then we, it'll kind of plug in to make sure it brought the right amino acid. And remember, amino acids are the monomers for making proteins, and we hold them together with, poly, with peptide bonds, and that's what makes the polypeptide chain. Okay, I think it'll make more sense as we dive in. All right, so let's look at the overarching process. We're going to translate, again, from nucleic acid language to protein language. We're going to take the mRNA and make a polypeptide from it. So we're going to read and follow the instructions carried on the mRNA that were copied from the DNA. We're going to make a polypeptide that will eventually fold into a protein. So this is going down in ribosomes, and it starts with mRNA, and we're going to end with a polypeptide. Okay, so here's what happens. mRNA is going to attach to a ribosome, and then the ribosome is going to read the codons, and it knows where to start reading because it looks for AUG. AUG is the start codon. You can see it down here on the mRNA. That's where it knows where to start. So every gene has the instructions begin with that will, with TAC, which will be transcribed into AUG. So that's really important. I remember because down here where we live, school starts in August. So translation starts in AUG, the beginning. Remember, one codon reads is three RNA nucleotides. And then the tRNAs act like taxis. They're going to plug in and drop off the amino acids based on what the codon says. And they're going to keep dropping off the amino acids, and, and the ribosome is going to keep binding the amino acids together with peptide bonds until it reaches a stop codon. And I'll show you on the genetic code in a second. It literally says stop, and that's when the ribosome knows to release the completed polypeptide chain. So one way that this is kind of proofread to make sure they bring the right amino acids is by these anticodons. If those don't fit the complement to the codon, then they won't drop off the amino acid. So that's one way we kind of double check that we're bringing the right amino acid based on what the instructions say. So again, we're going to interpret the RNA message into a polypeptide to eventually make a protein. So here's your ribosome. Here's your mRNA. It's being read. We're zooming in on our ribosome here, and we're just going to keep piecing together these amino acids. Now, it's much more complicated what's actually going on here, and there's multiple parts of the ribosome and all of that, but I'm not going to make you get into that. I will show you a couple animations, though, um, when we're together, and that I think will really help you visualize what is going on here. So I want to show you this genetic code again because I want to show you what I mean by stop. Okay, so look on the outside. There are um, 20 different amino acids, and then look, stop and stop. Those are what tell you, tell you to end. So if the codon is UAA, UAG, or UGA, you will stop translating. Okay, so here's an example of what the heck I'm talking about. So let's say we're starting with this DNA sequence. This is your template. This is the gene that we need to copy. So the mRNA sequence, you're going to pair up by the complementary bases. So T goes with A, A goes with U, C goes with G, G with C, C, G, T, A, etc. all the way down. So that's transcription right there. Now, the codons are the triplets. We're going to read this mRNA sequence in threes. Now, normally when I'm doing this, I'll just take, I'll draw a vertical line every three letters, starting at AUG, so that I can just kind of split it up. But you can also rewrite it and space them out in threes if that helps you. So those are your different codons. Those are the words. Each one of these translates into an amino acid. So first, let's look up AUG, okay? So we're going to go to our genetic code, start in the center, and work your way out. So find AUG. That codes for methionine. Okay, so methionine is going to be your amino acid. You can abbreviate by the first three letters, met. All right, let's look up CGA. You know I already have the answer here, CGA. Okay, start at the center, CGA. That codes for arginine right here. And if you look up UCA, you'll find serine. Here you'll find cysteine. And then if you look up UAA, you'll find stop. So if you do this correctly, you should always begin with MET because the start codon is always AUG, and then you should always end with a stop. Now, we can also see, okay, so this is the amino acid on the um, tRNA. What would be the anticodon on the other side of the tRNA? So you'd have MET on one side. What would be the complement to AUG? What well, would be UAC? 
and you can figure out the anticodons that would go on either end of the amino acid as well. I won't always ask you to determine these, but I just want you to know that that is a possibility. Okay, so we've talked about three processes over concept one and two, and so I want to summarize um, those and just kind of organize that information. So DNA replication, remember the purpose of that, which we learned about in concept one, is to make two identical DNA strands so that when the cell divides, all your cells have all the DNA they need. The nucleotides used to replicate DNA are the DNA nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. And then this happens in the nucleus because that's where your DNA is. Now, transcription and translation are the two steps for making proteins. So transcription, the purpose is to produce a strand of mRNA from DNA that can leave the nucleus and go to the ribosome. We do this using nucleotides, A, U, C, and G, because we're making mRNA. And this also happens in the nucleus because that's where the DNA is. Now, translation, the purpose is to produce a polypeptide that will fold into a protein. And we do that from the mRNA. The building blocks are the tRNAs, which are carrying amino acids. And this is happening in ribosomes. Now, a couple of questions for you to ponder. If all of our body cells have all of our DNA in them, then how come my cells are all so different? Like if they all have all of the genes and they can all make all the proteins because they have all the instructions, how come they're so different? Like why is a skin cell so different in function from a muscle cell if they have all the instructions for making the proteins? And the answer to that is regulation. This is really, really important. And this is a critical thing in terms of cell differentiation, which we talked about in unit two. Gene expression is a highly regulated process. Gene expression is whether we're going to turn a gene on or off, okay? So whether we're going to transcribe it, a gene or not is very, very regulated. Your cells don't, each cell doesn't transcribe all the genes to make all the proteins. They only do the ones they need for their specific functions. And gene expression is regulated all over. It's, it's regulated before, during, and after transcription and translation. And there are tons of examples of this that we'll get into in AP Bio. But one example is something called transcription factors. These are regulatory proteins that are controlling gene activity. There are repressors that decrease transcription and activators that increase transcription. You can also have things like viruses such as HIV that can disrupt regulation and thus disrupt gene expression. And so that's really important too. Another thing I want to mention, and then we'll get more into this in an activity in class, is epigenetics. This is the study of changes in gene expression that are heritable. Now, really, really important. This is different from mutations. Okay, so if you remember, Mutation is a change in your DNA sequence. Like the actual letters A, T, C, G are going to be changed. That's a mutation. And so, of course, that would be inherited because it would be passed on um, in your egg or your sperm. Now, epigenetics is different because the actual DNA sequence is not changed. Just how that DNA sequence gets expressed is changed. Okay, an example of this is called histone modification. So histones are these proteins, uh, let me see if I can get my mouse, here we go, these proteins that your DNA wraps around in order to condense and bunch up into chromosomes. Remember, your DNA is really, really long, it wouldn't fit in its cells unless it got really, really condensed into chromosomes. Now, if your histones squeeze your DNA tightly, your DNA can't be read, it can't be transcribed, and so um, gene expression won't happen, but if your histones relax, then we can read the DNA, we can transcribe it, and thus translate it into a protein. And so one example of epigenetics is when what the histones are either relaxed or they're tightened up, um, that changes. So the actual DNA doesn't change, but how if we're able to read it or not, it does. And there are some other examples too, but we're going to do a little web quest to explore those more. And that's protein synthesis.